Well, good morning, all. Please take your seats. Well, actually, don't take them. Just sit on them. It's probably not a good idea to walk out the door with a chair under your arm. Looks awfully like stealing. Um, so a, a very uh, warm welcome, greeting, actually, from my wife, Valerie. She sends her apologies. That's me. I'm the apology. <laughs> we had a wonderful couple of days with your pastors. They came and stayed, actually stayed in our home in Miami, and it was, Nancy must have been very relaxed because she came out in the morning with her pajamas and her hair and curlers. And I thought, the girls at home, we can do this journey together. And uh, they are, I'll tell you what I love about them, uh, and I know this is a hackneyed phrase, utterly, they're just, uh, they're utterly who they are. There's uh, no pretensions. They're not trying to be somebody else. They are, I'm just trying to think of the right word, they're authentic people, which I like. It would be very hard to try to manufacture another Mrs. Martin. <laughs> very difficult. The Lord broke the mold. I think he broke the mold just before it was finished forming, <laughs> which means she's slightly cracked. <laughs> Actually, that's me, not her. So it was lovely to have them in our home. They are wonderful pastors. Uh, I, that's my, I get the privilege of being able to connect with people like that and Eli and Kelly, and entirely different in so many ways. It's like going from um, a world banker to Thor. That's the difference. And uh, I just said to, to Eli, if you are Thor, what am I? And I figured it. I figured it. Who's the, uh, who's the, the New York c comedian? What was his name? I said his. Woody Allen. If he's Thor, I'm Woody Allen. <laughs> which, doesn't, which doesn't portend well for today's message. <laughs> you might be better to hear from Thor. You might be able to hammer some truth into you. That was quite good where I came from. <laughs> Sorry. I've only got, look, I'm going to take less time than I'm allotted because I'm a good boy. Um, my name is Simon McIntyre. That's the name my parents gave me, so I'm sticking with it. Um, I, I, was I was born in New Zealand, in the South Island of New Zealand, in a place called Christchurch, which was utterly and thoroughly English. Um, most of my adult life, uh, including the raising of all our children, I did in Australia in Sydney. I was there for 35 years. I moved to London uh, 12 years ago. We were there for 11 years. Uh, I love London. I, I, I'm a great fan of Europe. And uh, then we moved here, and so I'm getting into a new rhythm. I'm learning America. So if I make any unforeseen faux pas, it's entirely and completely a mistake, not intentional. If it is intentional, you'll know straight away. <laughs> no, not at all. So we moved to Miami. The reason we moved to Miami, we had some options. Valerie had spent 20 years in New York. We thought of New York. It was our first option. But um, she has family in Miami. And I'm a Sydney boy. I just got sick of grey, cold weather. So Miami became a better option. And since then, we are so glad we did it. And uh, she has family, all her family. Uh, she has a brother and sister who have never married. They live in, uh, they, one of them, the brother lives a matter of about two streets from us and her mother and her sister. So we thought, I thought it was good because at some stage we'll probably move back to Australia. I've got nine grandchildren there. And um, so we probably will move back at some stage although we may end up just living between Sydney and Miami. Um, I'm enjoying Miami. I didn't know if I would. There's only one thing about Miami that annoys me, is the people who refuse to speak English. So I'm going to have to flipping well learn Spanish. Come. Was that a Spanish-speaking person? Yes, yeah, you'd be quiet, sir. I don't need any further pressure to learn that language. I'm okay with tongues. I can speak English, English, Australian English, Kiwi English, and American English. That's five languages. <laughs> and now I've got to go and learn something else. Anyway, my privilege to be here and my pleasure. Um, love living in this country. Thank you for allowing me. I got my green card in four months. It's like a modern miracle. Uh, it was unbelievable how fast. It, I think they just gave it to me to shut me up. And uh, they told me never to vote and to have no political opinions. I said yes. Took the oath of allegiance. The book of Luke uh, specializes in the Holy Spirit, as does the book of Acts. 
Some commentators call the book of Acts the Acts of the Holy Spirit rather than the Acts of the Apostles. I think both are correct because they both have a particular function. And I know that right now your pastor's been taking you through a series on uh, the Holy Spirit. So I just said, I will stick with your series. So I'll bring this particular angle. What I'm going to do today um, in the next um, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes maximum, I'm going to look at the theme that Luke brings to us about the Holy Spirit, particularly in the early narratives, the birth narratives of John the Baptist and Jesus to look at what they say to us. Why did Luke write like this? You understand that all the gospel writers weren't just writing pure history. They were writing history with a purpose, which, by the way, is what most people write. There's no such thing as pure history because no one can write about everything that happened at that particular moment. So Luke writes with a particular focus and angle, and it is the power, the person, and the articulations of the Holy Spirit. So let's look at it through those early chapters and then relate it to ourselves and see you know, what that can mean or what that does mean to us. We're going to go straight to Zechariah uh, one fifteen of the book of Luke. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that all that John did was because he was prenatally filled with the Spirit. I find that stunning. Before he even began, before he breathed a breath on this earth, he was already filled with the Holy Spirit, which shows you something about the preciousness of life. But that's not the point of it. The point of it is, is that he was filled with the Spirit. Something of great significance was happening in biblical history. And what is particularly interesting is that there was no priests, no kings, no prophets involved. Oh, except Zechariah. But he was only one of many. He wasn't known for any other reason that he was included in the biblical record. So no, no prophets and no kings at this juncture in biblical history. Just, and I say this carefully, just ordinary people like most of us. Ordinary people like most of us. And I find that significant because in the Old Testament era, the Holy Spirit came upon kings and upon prophets, upon people of note, upon people who were leaders, upon, you know, what we used to call God's anointed. But in the New Testament era, it comes upon all flesh. And this is a revolution in biblical um, thinking. And it's a revolution in Jewish biblical thinking because suddenly the power of God, the Holy Spirit becomes available to the average person. And that was always God's plan. All through the prophetic realms of the Old Testament, right into these early stages of the New, there was always the plan that the everyman would be filled with a spirit that used to only inhabit kings and prophets, which elevates you and makes them also more ordinary. But let's go for the elevation of you. Sounds better. What's fascinating with John is that when he was filled with the spirit, and he was named to be a, a, named like a, a, an Elijahic person or a person like Elijah. The most stunning thing is that he did no miracles. Most of you, if you've read your Old Testament, will know that Elijah and Elisha are known for something like 16 miracles Elijah and I think 32 miracles Elisha. So when Elisha got a double portion, it wasn't just a cute saying. He literally did double the amount of miracles. In the life of John the Baptist filled with the same spirit, called under the same kind of name. He did no miracles. Where was the power in John? The preaching of repentance and forgiveness. Why does that need power? Because the Israelites were looking for political and military redemption that would take them back to be a nation to be reckoned with and rid them of the Italians. So, oh, sorry, the Romans. <laughs> that was a genuine slip of the tongue. Get rid of the Italians. I mean, where would you be without an Italian? And don't just say um, a little bit thinner because you wouldn't be eating pizza. So that was their idea of the fulfillment of all God had said. John said, no, it's that you personally repent and experience God's forgiveness. That doesn't sound so sexy to me as being world, conquerors of a nation. But that was what God was always doing. Because a true people fashioned after God are people who are forgiven Righteous because of what God has done 
and they have repented from their sins because they recognise personal moral culpability. I know that's a bit much for Sunday morning, isn't it? Perhaps I should just preach something sweet, sweet and light. Um, the other big theme is power, and I uh, will see that in Mary. Uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the angel Gabriel said to Mary, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Overshadow. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. This is a tremendous and terrifying moment for this young girl. Even Martin Luther said this, is that it was likely that Mary was between 13 to 14 or maybe 15 at the eldest. I mean, that, that rattles our, our cages. But that was, that was what it was. I, I won't say any more about it at the moment. But here was this girl who was hearing from an angel and told God's power would come upon her. All these thoughts must have raced through her mind. I'm not of the priestly class. I'm not a, I'm not a daughter of a king. I, I, I'm not, I don't have a prophetic ministry. And yet God spoke to her. Do you know what that says to me? If God can speak to an ordinary person like Mary, my gosh, can he speak to you? I think so. You don't have to be famous. In fact, you're better not to be famous. It's too much of a problem. You're better not to be well known. You're better not to be rich and fabulous. Why? Because those things set up all their own pains and problems. You're better to be an ordinary person that hears God speak to them. And that's the promise of the New Testament era, that God will speak to his people. It's wonderful, wonderful to be able to sit down and read the scriptures and wait and pray on God's presence and feel the sense of the whole. When I read the word of God, I literally feel, and not every day, I've got to get in the right frame for it. But I feel like this um, fire or warmth or energy. I mean, I know this is all a bit spooky, but that's, this is, you know, my experience. When I'm reading, I feel it, and I feel that God's Holy Spirit. And the other day I was praying, and I, I felt like I just put my hand out like that, and I, could, I said, that, you're there, Holy Spirit. Now, I know that technically I meant to say that he's within. I, I get that. But this tangible presence of God is not... Is not um, confined just, just to within, the same Holy Spirit. So Mary, Mary gets, there's, a, there's, a, there's a powerful miracle that happens within her womb that's, that results in the incarnation of the Word of God. Unbelievable. But all through it, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. It almost becomes boring in repetition because Luke's making a point. And then, of course, we read that in 141 to 45, and I won't read all these, but I'm, I've, I've um, shortened it. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, so Mary was her cousin. Was she? Yes, must have been. The child, six months old within her, leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Not only the child, but it was like a double whammy. Filled with the Holy Spirit. The child, and she said, the child in my womb leaped for joy. It's interesting, straight away, Mary didn't just feel something, she spoke something. And that's Luke's point constantly. When the Holy Spirit comes, there will be an articulation. There will be a prophecy. There will be a voice of creative power. And that happened all the way through these early birth narratives of John and Jesus. And uh, she said, the mother of my Lord. I mean, what a staggering thing to say to your younger cousin the mother of my Lord. She said that by inspiration because she was filled with the Spirit. She cannot have known that naturally. It would have been abhorrent to her naturally to think like that. It was revelation at that moment. Wonderful. Joy, proclamation, blessing, infilling, wonderment, all because of the Holy Spirit. And then you see that Mary, she gets filled and she sings this song of praise. Again, Luke's point, the Holy Spirit always leads to prophecy and praise. When we're praising God, we've got to understand we're not just singing words. There's something happening. We're saying something. We're proclaiming something. We're envisaging something. Wonderful. And then she, she has this song of praise. It's rich with prophetic insight. It includes the past and it goes into the future. But what's particularly staggering in what Mary said to me is she upturns all the social categories of her day. She said, the proud will be brought down, the rich will walk away empty-handed. It's the humble, those not seen, that God has shown himself to. 
And she rejoiced that the Lord showed him to her, a person of no specific account except to God. And she said some wonderful things about the future of God's people, about the fulfillment of the promises of Israel, and about the marvel of the, of the son that she would bear. What, what a staggering life Mary must have had, knowing what she did. You read so many times, Mary treasured these things in her heart, which means she didn't understand them, but they were rich and deep and real to her. And she did all these things inspired by the Holy Spirit. And then we go through to Zechariah. That's funny, my watch has stopped. Isn't that a good excuse? Oh, it's all right, I've got a calendar behind me. That was funny in Australia. <laughs> Clearly they're a little bit th- slow. John the Baptist, when, when he was born, his father, his mouth was opened, his tongue was freed, and began to speak praising God. Once again, same theme. Fill the Spirit. He praised God and he spoke prophetically about his son and tied themes together from the past and spoke off into the future. I love this wonderful stuff. And then we, we, we quickly hop through to um, uh, the presentation of Jesus in the temple. We see that the Holy Spirit rested upon Simeon. Uh, he was revealed something by the Holy Spirit. He was guided by the Holy Spirit. He was, his life was in the Spirit, but nobody knew him. Isn't that, again, fascinating? Nobody knew him. He wasn't in the hierarchy of the priestly class, but he was a person that Luke said was a prophet. And when he took Jesus, he said that Jesus was a light for revelation to the Gentiles. That is shock horror to a normal, self-respecting, kosher-eating Jew. Shock horror to them that the Gentiles would be included. I live in a community in uh, in Miami that's almost entirely Jewish. And uh, and I enjoy living in that community. But I know that I know that in their thinking, and this is please, my grandmother's Jewish, so I can say this. This is not anti-Semitic, please don't go there. But they think that they're superior, and I'm just the Gentile. I spoke to an Orthodox Jewish man with, you know, the hats? Are they Hasidic? The big fur, I mean, why you'd wear a fur hat in summer in Miami, I'm not quite sure. I mean, it must be like a tremendous weight loss program for him. And uh, he was under this hat, and I was walking along the streets after being out for dinner one night, and I said, good evening, sir. He did not know what to do. Shalom, shalom. Didn't know what to do, because they see themselves as entirely superior. And um, I'm, that's, a, that's a fact. It's not a criticism of mine. That's what would have happened when Mary spoke this. They would have been shocked at what she said, utterly shocked. It seemed so contrary to everything they thought and wanted, but it was all the time right through their writings. So, and then Anna, Anna turns up. She's a prophet. She's called a prophet. And by the same spirit, she spoke about the wonder of God's redeeming love that had arrived in the person of Jesus. What's the point? When the Holy Spirit is here, the Holy Spirit speaks. That's his job. He's, the Holy Spirit's the articulation of the will of God and a person. My last thing, no, I'm going to wrap it up quicker. What does this mean for us? Because, I mean, this could be nothing more than an interesting Bible study. Um, what does it mean to us? What did the Holy Spirit in these stories mean? tell us? Or what's he continuing to tell us? What should we expect? Well, one thing you shouldn't expect is to say that you're pregnant and God did it. So we'll leave that one alone. <laughs> we'll leave that one up to immoral categories. That would be bad theology. Imagine Joseph, you are what? You're pregnant and God's... No, I'm sorry, darling. I'm sorry. I mean, what planet were you born on? Imagine this poor kid. She's... No wonder the Catholic Church reveres her like they do, because we have disrevered her. We've sort of pushed her aside. She's a remarkable woman. I look forward to meeting her. Not sure she wants to meet me, but I look forward to meeting her. (laughs) What are the thoughts that we can say for us today? The Spirit speaks to the saving plan of God in the church and continues to. We've often made the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit highly and particularly individualistic, which is 
part of the curse of the, the Renaissance is that everything is gridded through how it affects me. That's why people today, they say my truth. There's no longer truth that doesn't exist. It's my truth. So whereas my truth is real, but we have become so individualistic. I, I think it's choking our souls. It's like we've got asthma of the spirit because of this terrible focus. Most messages that I hear are focused on you as the individual. But the Holy Spirit does not not do that. This is good English. The Holy Spirit actually does that. That's even better English. But the Holy Spirit also speaks largely to the church and to God's church. So the prophecies that were spoken of to these couples today are not about them. They're about what they will do for God's church, for your community, for the city of Dallas. Another issue, prayers will be answered. That's, that's in the text there. Um, prophetic words and courage and comfort. We get that. There'll be a revelation of Scripture. Whenever the Holy Spirit's around, Scripture becomes alive and vital and transformative. There's the guidance by the Holy Spirit in many areas. The exaltation of the humble and the lowly. But you know, it, it, let me two, two last points. One of them is this, is that when John the Baptist came preaching, it's fascinating because it says, I think in Luke, either, I think it's 4.1, it says that in, in the day when of the Emperor Tiberius, the Roman emperor, emperor um, the Pontius Pilate, the local governor or representative, Herod, the Jewish king, or Philip, and Ananias and Caphias, who were both um, the high priests in those years. It says, the word of the Lord came to John in the wilderness, not to any of them. All the normal hierarchy were missed. We need to, we need to take heart to that. We don't, you don't have to have famous. You don't have to have rich. I mean, you know, there's, there's value in some of these things, but they're not the core tenets of what we're about. We're about God speaking to the average person marvelously and wonderfully. I'm as ordinary as they get, and God has chosen to fill me with his spirit and speak through me. I'm not particularly good. I was never, I never preached in the early years. I never led. I wasn't a leader. I've, everything I've done is because of default or because there's nobody else. <laughs> and here I am. God's second or third choice. It's often the case. There were better people than me, of course. But one of the key issues that many feel is the, the big issue of the Holy Spirit. And it's this empowerment for service. Empowerment for service. So service with spiritual gifts within the body of Christ and empowerment to take the message beyond the body of Christ. Because we need power in our words to convict people of their sin. And of God's love for them. Because you can't have an argument with a, you can have an argument with a philosophy that can be beat, beat by a better philosoph philosophical argument. But you can't contradict the power of a spirit-breathed word that takes people's hearts captive. <laughs> if you've listened to the sermons of Billy Graham, and some of you are far too young to even know who Billy Graham was. But Billy Graham, one of the greatest 20th century evangelists. Have you listened to his messages? They are simple beyond belief. They were so unnuanced and uncomplex. You go, but you know what? He just spoke scripture with conviction. The Holy Spirit rode on those words and brought challenge and change to people's. My mum and dad went to a Billy Graham crusade years and years, a, a long time ago, kiddies. A long time ago, and they, they made a commitment. They never followed up for it, but years later, they went to a wonderful, charismatic church and got filled with the Spirit. Their salvation impacted me. I was a hippie kid. I was a drummer in a band, a hippie kid, doing a bit of weed, living with my girlfriend. Just, you know, it's all typical of that era, isn't it? Um, I, used to, I used to have hair. <laughs> now it just sort of migrates south on your body. It's a little bit uh, unusual. The point of the Spirit is to empower you for service inside and outside God's church. It may be the most important. Lord, we just thank you today. I thank you for, uh, for, for your Holy Spirit who brings direction, correction, help, wonderment, revelation, healing, miracles to our lives. And we... 
Lord, I pray on behalf of all these people today, the simplest prayer ever, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit today. Come again to your church. Come Holy Spirit to our lives, in our homes, with our families. Come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give him a hand. It's fantastic to have one of the apostles of our movement here. And Pastor Simon, thrilled to have you here today. Hey, this is a great day. Been an awesome day. Uh, Pastor Matthew and Jane, love for you to stand here on this side. And Pastor Derek, you and Russ Lanston on this side. I want you to come by and give him a hug, hand, high five, a, uh, your condolences, whatever it is that you feel in your heart. Just... Hey, let them know that you love them, you're standing with them, and you're for them. Uh, we also have some of the rest of our executive team, maybe you, you guys, uh, Robert, Carfield, Melissa, who pray for you if you have a prayer need. And, uh, and so uh, we want to stand with you, believe with you, and pray with you. Come Holy Spirit. Every Look, Jesus said the Holy Spirit is with us and in us at the same time. He's in us and with us at the very same time. Our every interaction with God, whether it be a fleeting thought that goes through our mind or a spoken word that sticks in our spirit, is through our relationship with God the Holy Spirit. God the Spirit. And so today, my prayer for you is that you would be open to, aware, and embrace the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. He, he's an expert at using nobodies. And uh, he's an expert at it. You look at the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, it's a book full of nobodies that God did a major work in and showed his glory through. Amen? Let's all stand together. May the Lord keep you and bless you and fill you with overflowing hope, joy, and peace. And may the life of God be ministered through you to others as you receive and embrace the love that Christ has for you. Well, I bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.